Giants have arrived at Egghead, and this can only mean one thing. Well, not really. This could actually mean many things. For example, that perhaps the long-awaited wait for the Elbuff arc is finally over, all our questions about Shanks' true knowledge of the world's lore will be answered, and we can now add giants to the list of a select few figures or groups of people who have a special relationship with, or at least knowledge of, Sun God Nika. But also, maybe, just maybe, that Joy Boy was a giant, and actually we're going to discuss all of the above. Because Oda decided that a battle between a Yonko crew, a genius scientist's overpowered inventions, CP0 agents, an admiral, a Gorosei, and a 20 battleship strong buster call is simply not enough, now we have the Elbafian warriors to add to the mix. How do you write a climax? This is how you write a climax. After teasing readers about who would be making their way to Egghead, in chapter 1106, we saw the great arrival of the giant warrior pirates led by their captains Dory and Broggy. And before we dive deep into speculation territory about what this means about the relationship between giants Shanks and Joy Boy, there are a few details about this unexpected appearance that we have to discuss. The last time we saw Dory and Broggy was in chapter 1079 where they helped Shanks blast Kid and the rest of Kid's crew to the bottom of the ocean, just off the shores of Elba. And this in itself was quite the unexpected surprise. We have no idea when these two got to Elbaf, nor for what purpose. Because as far as we were aware, these two giants continued fighting, even despite somewhat making up at the end of the Little Garden arc. Snapshots that we saw of this duo via cover stories throughout the series show Dory and Broggy still being very much involved in their competitive battle to prove who's stronger. But there they were in chapter 1076, and 1079 as chummy as ever taking orders or rather requests from Shanks. And logically the first conclusion that I came to was that this would be how we get to Elba for our next arc. The mystical Lorefield Island of the Giant Warriors is an arc that we've been waiting for for many many years. And more recently Oda has himself hinted that we would in fact be heading to Elba possibly as early as 2024 because in his jump Confessed the message, Oda said, if Luffy and the others can leave Egghead safely, they should be going to that island. I also considered not taking that route, but I may not be able to stop Luffy if that does end up happening. Now, we don't know for sure what is that island that Oda's referring to, but given our long anticipation for Elbaf, it was fair to assume that that was the island he was talking about. And now that these two warrior pirates have shown up, it's seeming more and more likely that this is our segue into Elbaf. Although, to be fair, contrary to his Jump Festa message, where Oda implied that it would be because of Luffy's will and adventurous spirit that we find ourselves in the Island of Giants, it doesn't seem like Luffy and the crew have much of a choice because the giants have shown up and may be taking them to Elbaf because it's the only way out of this battle at Egghead. But putting that aside, the really interesting part about their arrival was their knowledge of Luffy as the sun god Nika. Begging the question, what exactly is the relationship between the giant race and the legendary deity for them to know about the great sun god? Well, the most obvious answer could be that it's via Shanks. These giant warriors are obviously closely affiliated with the red hair captain, and by now it's practically confirmed that Shanks knows and has always known the truth about Luffy's devil fruit. The man didn't just go attack a CP9 ship for shits and giggles, knowing that they had no treasure but a single, and supposedly to the rest of the world, a very unassuming, unimportant Paramecia devil fruit. In fact, this was pretty heavily hinted in the flashback in chapter 1054. Shanks sees Luffy's new bounty poster, the one that has captured him in all of his Nika glory, and this prompts Shanks to reminisce on how he attacked that world government ship all those years earlier solely to acquire that devil fruit and then the time that he spent with Luffy touching his arm or should I say lack thereof, suggesting that Shanks' knowledge that the fruit had chosen Luffy and understanding what that means about Luffy being the chosen joy boy of the new era is a great part of why Shanks sacrificed his arm to save the young boy. So then the easy 
the answer could be that when the Giants and Shanks reunited at Elbarth, catching up, some stories might have been shared. You could imagine Dory and Broggy bringing up this story about this strange kid and his crew that helped them stop fighting, and despite this crew being greenhorns, that they showed great promise and great potential, and Shanks could have remarked, Oh, I know that kid. He's actually a special boy. In fact, the most special of boys. Filling the Giants in on the lore of Joy Boy, Nika, and our Straw Hat Captain. Now that's the most straightforward answer, and I don't want to dismiss it entirely, but it also feels a little underwhelming. Maybe too easy, which doesn't mean that for that reason it can't be true, but personally, given how long Oda has teased the Elbaf arc, and with these two giants retaking center stage to be important characters once more after a thousand chapters later, and it really is almost a thousand chapters to the T because the first time the Straw Hats met the Giants was in chapter 116, titled Big or according to other interpretations, Giant. So the two chapters 116 and 1106 also read Giants on your side. As in here we have Giants by Luffy and the Straw Hat side, which is just beautiful and very, very impressive if this was intentional. But back on track, given how important the Giants are to the series, and even more so now as we make our way to Elbaf, supposedly, I think it's fair to assume that there is a special link between the giant race to Sun God Nika that is to be explored. Firstly, this would be much more in line with how all the other special non-human races in One Piece also seem to have a direct relationship to Nika. I said this recently in another video of mine, but I think it was King, the last of the Lunarians, who told Kaido about Joy Boy. And I would assume that this has something to do with how the Lunarians are a marginalized, now almost extinct race that was in direct conflict with the world government, so having some sort of belief or knowledge or even relationship with a figure like Joy Boy or the Sun God Nika, the warrior of liberation, would make sense. We already know about the special relationship between Joy Boy and the Fishmen, Joy Boy even making a specific promise to the Fishmen, the Buccaneers, another marginalized a near extinct race having carried and passed on their belief in the mystical deity through the generations. So for giants, another ancient and mystical non-human race to have knowledge about Sun God Nika just seems to fit the bill. Second, it was clear from much earlier on that giants must have a special relationship to Joy Boy, given that Jaguar D. Saul, the big friendly giant, is a member of the D clan. Now interestingly, Saul is a giant, but not a member of the Elbaf tribe of giants, although he has been living there since the Ohara incident. Now this could mean that whatever specific giant race Saul is a part of, that family or tribe of giants had a more direct relationship to Joy Boy, but it would still make sense that the giants as a whole were allied with Joy Boy in some capacity, and they all now have knowledge of this great figure. Thirdly, apart from their larger than human size, we also know that giants have a longer than human lifespan. Dory and Broggy, despite being 160 years old, seem to be very much in their prime right now. The old captains of the giant warrior pirates, Jarul and Jorul, RIP, these two former captains partook in piracy for 300 years. And even after his retirement, Jarul is not a weak and feeble old man. Which means that while the events of the Void Century seem close to a millennia ago, separated from the current storyline by tens of generations, for giants, the events that took place in the Void Century and between the 20 kingdoms and Joy Boy happened only in their grandparents' lifetime. So it would actually make most sense that they have a very fresh knowledge of Sun God Nika and Joy Boy. Heck, if anything, it would actually explain how Shanks knows so much, more so than being the other way around that Shanks told Dory and Broggy, it would make more sense that they told him all the law. Because at the end of the day, Shanks never went to Laugh Tale with Roger. Everything he found out about the truth of the world is because of his encounters after Roger's death. Meaning that it would make more sense that he has befriended the Giants, or maybe rekindled a relationship if we assume that Roger was also friends with the Giants and that's how Shanks knew them. Either way, that they told Shanks about Nika and Joy Boy. Shanks filling in the gaps as he kept adventuring. Although, Shanks supposedly wouldn't be able to 
read the Polnic glyphs to fill in the gaps himself, unless he learned how to from Odin, or there's another secret Wano escapist in his crew. But I digress, you know what I mean. Now fourthly, there is always the case of that giant straw hat in Imu's chambers. Now I didn't lead with this because I didn't want people commenting I'm a fraud, because I know I very recently discussed how that large hat at Marjoie is much more likely to be befitting the size of a buccaneer rather than a giant, and it was only very recently that I discussed the possibility of Joy Boy being a buccaneer. Whereas now, we're going to go down the rabbit hole of whether Joy Boy was indeed a giant. But this doesn't discredit anything I said in that video, I still stand by the points that I made, and I would actually highly recommend that you go and watch it, because it ties in quite nicely to what we're going to discuss here. And before we do go any further, please make sure to subscribe to this channel. I love to discuss One Piece, and if you do too, then this is the channel for you. So while I have said in the past that the straw hat at Marijoie seems too large for a human, but potentially too small for a giant, I did also say that size and proportions in One Piece can be pretty inconsistent and misleading. So it is still possible that that hat is in fact giant sized. Plus giants also come in different shapes and sizes. For example, Jaguar de Sol, whom we've established seems to have a closer relationship to Joy Boy, is about 15% smaller than Dorian Broggy, meaning that the hat could fit a much smaller giant. Anyways, going back to that previous video of mine, while I did wonder whether it was the Buccaneers being the direct descendants of Joy Boy that made them such a hated race in the eyes of the world government, this could still be true whether Joy Boy was a buccaneer or a giant. Because what if Joy Boy was a giant who had relations with a non-giant, creating a new species, the buccaneers? What? Now cue all the jokes, I'm expecting jokes similar to the ones that went around about Toki and Odin, like ha ha ha, what a hard time that must have been for the poor human woman having sex with a giant, <laughs> get it, hard. But again, Ignoring how that would have actually worked physically, the only way that it does make sense for buccaneers to share the blood of giants while not quite being giants themselves would be the result of gene mixing. And seeing as there are no other obvious non-human traits about the buccaneers such as fins, long arms or wings, the most straightforward answer is that the buccaneers are the result of a giant and human relationship. Well actually, knowing how technologically advanced the ancient kingdom was, the buccaneers could also be a genetically modified race entirely, like a new invention, but that's a whole nother thing. So instead, if we go back to my point about the buccaneers being such a detested race for being the descendants of Joy Boy, then I would have to say that the human partner that must be the matriarch to have started the buccaneer race alongside Joy Boy would most likely have to be Nefertari Lily. It's hard to keep up with the sheer volume of new lore that was revealed in the Egghead Island arc, but one of the greatest lore drops that we've had was the fact that the Nefertari family is also a part of the D-Clan, and that their former queen betrayed the rest of the monarchs that formed the world government by not joining them at Marijoie, instead playing a big part in spreading the Polnoglyphs across the world. And with this reveal of a new mysterious woman, there's something quite suspicious about one of the kingdoms who was initially a part of the 20 monarchs who were opposed the ancient kingdom being a part of the D clan. I mean, we know that the D clan is nuanced, they're not all good guys, but still, we at least know that the D is the name of those who oppose the world government. So how was one of the 20 kingdoms in cahoots with the people who oppose that very same coalition of 20 kingdoms? Was Lily always a double agent? Did she just pretend to be a part of the 20 kingdoms? If so, why let things get to the stage of defeating the ancient kingdom slash joy boy to the extent that the 20 monarchs could start a new era as the world government. Shouldn't or wouldn't she have betrayed them much earlier before joy boy could have been defeated? So all of this leads me to wonder, what if Lily and the Nefertari family weren't a 
originally part of the D clan. It is, after all, the will of D. So what if, after meeting Joy Boy, Lily inherited his will, joining his cause, and therefore then also becoming a part of the D clan? And now I apologize in advance, but the joke is so obvious, I just have to say it. What if Nefertari Lily inherited the will of D after quite literally receiving the D? Could you imagine if we have some sort of star-crossed lover story, a very super high-stakes relationship that resulted in Lily's pregnancy? And maybe that's why she never joined the others at Marriage Wild, because she was quite obviously very pregnant with the very first buccaneer. And having a baby would have been something very hard to hide, especially if the baby comes out half giant size. And if you watch that other video of mine that I just keep referencing, I'm sorry, I'm not just shamelessly plugging for the sake of it, it is actually relevant. You may remember that I discussed the real life history of buccaneers, a specific type of pirates who acted with a degree of authority and legitimacy gained from British and other European governments, yet being pirates all the same. Well, if the buccaneers in One Piece are the offspring between perhaps one of the greatest pirates in the world, i.e. Joy Boy, and royalty, i.e. Lily, then it makes perfect sense that Oda would name this new race as the Buccaneers, a paradoxical mix of piracy and royalty. And this could, again, be the reason why the Buccaneers are so hated by the world government, but now, not only representing Joy Boy as his descendant, but also serving as a constant reminder of Queen Lily's betrayal and the fact that the world government still faces threats and vulnerabilities due to the existence of those polyglyphs that Lily spread out across the world. In this way, the Buccaneers would be the very bane of the world government's existence, a symbol of the undying will of Joy Boy. Although that being said, it did seem like Imu was still not yet sure of Lily's true allegiance, and if the world government knew that the Buccaneers were Lily's offspring, it would then be very obvious that Lily did in fact side with Joy Boy, and the so-called mistake of scattering the Poneglyphs was not in fact a mistake. But still, seeing the emergence of a new half-giant race could still imply that Joy Boy had a child with a human, regardless of who that human was, and would still be caused to hate the Buccaneers. You get what I mean? Well, that's where my brain has been spiraling to ever since seeing the appearance of Dory and Broggy at Egghead. But also, there is another part of my brain that has also been very much wondering, what was that panel in chapter 1079 that showed Blackbeard's ship making its way to Egghead? We were very much expecting it to be the Blackbeard pirates become involved in this mess that is the Egghead climax and finale, and so the arrival of the giants was a total slap in your face. What happened to that ship? Is Blackbeard or some of the 10 Titanic captains still on their way? Well, I think that topic is actually worthy of its own discussion, so please, if you have any thoughts on Blackbeard's plans, then let me know. In the meantime, if you haven't already, make sure to watch my video about the Buccaneers. Like I said, it is quite relevant to this discussion that we've just had. And look, if you've stuck it out with me until this point, you may as well like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, because you're clearly my people, and I'm your people, so we should keep in touch. On that note, thank you for listening to another one of my rambling. Thank you to all of our Patreon and channel members for your continued support. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.